weeks ago, I was invited to go for a Sunday afternoon boat ride. And I hesitated. Now, I love being on the water. And I'm not afraid at all of boats. And I hadn't yet had an opportunity to cruise the shores around here and out into the Chesapeake. But the forecast for that day was hot and humid. I wasn't afraid of drowning. I was afraid of burning up. Each of us copes with our life opportunities based on our past experience. And my experience of boating had mostly been in small crafts. You know, I just love to paddle silently along the shores, slipping in and out of the shade of the overhanging trees and taking in all the sights of the wildlife and scenery. And I've also enjoyed sunset cruises in a runabout or fishing over the edge of a skiff, but none of these boats offers any protection from the sun. So my experience was telling me to be cautious of boating on a sunny afternoon in open water. Now Jesus didn't so much invite the disciples to go for a boat ride as he commanded them. He looked at the crowds that had gathered and figured we're finished ministry in this area and then gave orders to go to the other side. The Sea of Galilee, which is the body of water that they were crossing, is actually a fresh water lake situated in the Jordan Rift Valley. The Pigeon Mountains to the west act as a funnel for the prevailing winds that are coming off the Mediterranean. And boaters throughout the centuries have been familiar with the risk of sudden violent storms. The disciples and Jesus hopped into the boat, and Jesus, exhausted from teaching and preaching in the press of the crowds, fell asleep in the stern bulkhead where the ropes are stored. In fact, he fell asleep using those ropes as a pillow. A storm blew in. Well, it wasn't just a storm. I know our, NSR, our NRSV translation says windstorm, but the King James Version describes it as a great tempest of the sea. Matthew, when he was writing this gospel, just didn't use any word for storm. He pulled out his Greek thesaurus and used the word simos, or quake to describe the terrible eruption of sea and sky. A great seismos arose on the lake. Max Lucado, in his book, Fearless, notes that Matthew uses this word on only two other occasions. Once at the death of Jesus when Calvary shook, and again at Jesus' resurrection when the graveyard trembled. Apparently, this storm shares equal Billy in the trilogy of Jesus' great shakeups, defeating sin on the cross, death at the tomb, and here, silencing fear on the seas. In the middle of this storm, so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, the disciples cried out to Jesus, Lord, save us! We are perishing! And he woke up and asked, why are you afraid, you of little faith? Not about you, but fear seems to me to be a natural response to this life-threatening situation. So what does this retort of Jesus' teach us? First, fear can be helpful, but only to a point. The purpose of fear is to identify <coughs> danger and evoke a quick response. Fear teaches us to prepare for storms, to wear and carry paddles, wear life preservers and carry paddles, and check the weather forecast before we travel. It activates our flight or fight instincts, causing a boat's captain to turn into the wind and take those waves head on rather than broadside. But fear can also cripple us. It deadens our recall and corrodes our confidence in God's goodness. It unleashes a swarm of doubts, anger-stirring, soul-parching, trust 
erasing doubts. There are many kinds of fear. In this instance, several of the disciples are trained seamen. They need to have faith that their God-given and long-practiced nautical skills are part of the Lord's way forward. Just like a police officer or a first responder entering the scene of a domestic violence call, these disciples need to be alert to all possibilities while they instinctively and calmly sail on. The question, why are you afraid, asks us to evaluate the situation and our response to it. Identifying your fears yanks them out of the dark and exposes them to God's light. It asks us to recall the ways that God's Spirit has aided us in the past. Faith propels us out of fear and into God's grace. In this case, Jesus stepped out from his napping place, and, which was in the stern of the boat, and calmed the wind and the waves. Now earlier that day or that week, he had cleansed a lake leper who had faith that Jesus could make him clean. He had healed a centurion's servant because the centurion had believed that Jesus had the authority to command such a cure. He had made it possible for Peter's mother-in-law to be revived from a fever, and she rose and served him again, faithfully. As we face our fears, it helps us to identify why we are afraid, to remember that the Lord is with us, in this shaky voyage and to trust that ultimately he is in control and will make a way forward for us. This week on the youth mission trip to Pittsburgh, our youth faced new and frightening challenges and they were able to face their fears because they trusted the men and the women who were coaching them. The Spirit has worked through our youth leaders in the past and continued to do so every day on this trip. So one of our youngest girls, Haley, who was afraid of heights, was able to climb a tall scaffold and use a power tool on the grout of a brick wall. Carly, another first-timer, learned how to use a circular saw. On my site, we tore down a porch roof. It was so rotten that it threatened to crash down around us before we could remove it. Once it was down, we reset rafters and began to sheet the new roof. All of this work was done from the top of a scaffolding or on the actual roof. Bill King, our master craftsman, was respectfully afraid of the potential dangers. Now, he didn't quake for himself. He wasn't afraid to get up on that roof. Rather, he wanted the youth to learn the skills to overcome their fear and the challenge of the job, but safely. It was very exciting to see these young men and women face their fears and work in harmony to build for the Lord. The stilled storm gives us a personal story of God's grace so that we can face our fear with faith. But like most of Jesus' parables and stories, it has a message for our community as well. Each story in the book of Matthew does double duty because the Gospel of Matthew is not simply an eyewitness account laying out the facts of Jesus' life. Rather, it is a biography type of storytelling that was common in the Greek culture. It was written in the years following the total destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Matthew told these stories of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection to form a community. He wrote to share Jesus' lessons on forgiveness and the presence of God and the will of 
the ways of following God's will. This gospel, this good news was written intentionally to shape the identity of a disrupted people called out from their foundation in the Jewish faith and living under the cultural and political denomination of the Roman Empire. He was calling them into a community of Christ followers. So the boat is a metaphor for that community of followers. You know, still today, we call this part of the church a nave, which is the Latin word for boat. So you're all sitting in the boat, rowing together. And the seismos, the chaotic shaking of wind and waves, represents the truly turbulent times. This story is told to remind both the first century community and ours that the Lord's love is more powerful than any earthly force. We are called to cross to the other side, to leave what is familiar and comfortable behind in order to bring others Christ's abundant life. We will encounter storms, but the one calling us into service is the one who can rebuke the wind and the sea and ultimately create life and peace. That Sunday a few weeks ago, as I traveled along the shores of the South River and out into the Chesapeake Bay, the landmarks spoke to me the stories of our region. Did you know that London Town was legislated to be the county seat over 300 years ago? But it didn't thrive until Annapolis became the capital and county seat. Around 1760, in this busy port, though, William Brown built a public house, which is a combination of a tavern and a community meeting halls and an inn. For some 20 years, the Browns lived and worked there until they lost the house to creditors and it became a rental property. The county purchased it in 1828 to transform it into an almshouse for the marginalized and struggling people in the region. In 1965, after serving as a home for the poor and elderly for 137 years, it was closed when Social Security Act initiated Medicare and Medicaid. In the 70s, preservationists restored the Brown House and the Woodland Gardens so that visitors could walk through this landmark to experience our history. On that simple Sunday cruise, I saw the marks of our community stories of industry and wealth and poverty and restoration. Nothing stays the same forever. In different seasons, people and places survive different storms and are called to be refashioned for different purposes. God was at work through the chaos. And it makes me wonder where we are called to work in this community during this season, where is that other side for us? We want the calm and safety that's pictured in that harbor, that's a harbor in my neighborhood. We want that calm and safety. Or we look forward on a Sunday afternoon to cruise along the waterways, but every time we get in a boat to sail, we take a risk. Life isn't about playing it safe. It's about taking risks for the kingdom of God, knowing that God will go with us. So, who wants to go for a boat ride? Let us pray. Lord of wind and water, of calmness and peace, be with us this day. Calm our fears as we face uncertain futures. Help us to relinquish control and to place our trust totally in you. Remind us to continually do faithful work for good 
with gratitude for the many blessings you have poured upon us. When the waves and torrents threaten us, let us again turn to you, remembering your saving mercies and love. Give us courage to become disciples who can calm the seas of doubt and anger and bring hope and peace. As we have brought before you the situations that require help and healing mercies, remind us again that you are with each person and situation, offering your love and mercy. We thank you for the many ways in which you have already healed us. For the goodness that you have poured on us, we offer prayers of gratitude and love, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>